So far, we've seen how we can construct and estimate OLS. We've also seen how we can test hypotheses about population parameters using our OLS estimates. But whenever you're presented with OLS results, it's important to think about how you would go about carefully interpreting what those results actually mean. In this video, we're going to introduce how you could go about interpreting regression results. So, in order to illustrate this, let's consider an example. We might hypothesize that the ch a, um, an individual's tenure within, the, within a job is going to affect their wages. So, in other words, if they've been employed for longer in a, in a, um, in a job, then their gross weekly wages are expected to be higher. So in order to test this hypothesis, I've collected 350 randomly sampled observations from the UK Labour Force Survey of individuals aged 25 to 45. And we can plot out the, their gross weekly wage and the months continuously employed in a job as such. Now, we want to run a regression of gross weekly wages as our dependent variable and months continuously employed as our explanatory variable. And if we do this, we get results that look something like this. But how do we go about carefully interpreting these regression results? Well, I'm going to suggest that there's an algorithm that you can follow whenever you're asked to carefully interpret some regression results. And this algorithm is made up of three steps. The first step is ask the question, how well does the line that we've estimated here, this is the line that we've estimated, how well does that line fit the observed data? In other words, what does the R squared from the regression actually mean? The second stage is to ask the question about whether or not the estimated coefficients are statistically significant. If the coefficient on our explanatory variable is equal to zero, for instance, that would tell us that our explanatory variable had no impact on the dependent variable. So we need to try and test whether or not these coefficients are statistically significant. If they're not statistically significant, then we'd be saying that they're not significantly different from zero. The third, th the third step is to ask, are the estimated coefficients economically significant? Now, this is the step that lots of people often miss out, but it's actually probably the most important step because this is about explaining what the estimated coefficient actually means. And we're trying to ask, is this estimated effect a big effect? So let's apply these three questions to our estimated relationship. So the first question is actually really easy. How well does the line fit the data? Well, in order to do this, we're just going to interpret the R squared. The R squared here is equal to 0 0.0584. So what that's telling us is that 5.84% of the variation in our dependent variable is explained by our model. Or in other words, 5.84% of the variation in the gross weekly wages is being explained by variation in the months continuously employed. Now, conversely, you could say, well, if 5.84% of the variation is explained, that's telling us that 94.16% of the variation is unexplained. So there's, in this example, there's a large amount of the variation in gross weekly wages, which is unexplained by the model. So there's going to be a lot of other things, potentially, which are explaining that variation in the gross weekly wage. But let's move on to step two and ask whether or not the estimated coefficients are statistically significant. Now here, I'm only going to focus in on the slope parameter, but you could also do the same exercise with the intercept. So are the coefficients statistically significant? And in particular, we're going to try and ask here, does the explanatory variable have any statistically significant impact on the dependent variable? 
are the months continuously employed having any statistically significant impact on the gross weekly wage? And that question is equivalent to testing the null hypothesis that beta 1 is equal to zero, which is saying that months continuously employed has no impact on gross weekly wages, against the alternative that beta 1 is non-zero, which is telling us if beta 1 is non-zero, then months continuously employed is having some effect on the gross weekly wage. Now, in order to test this hypothesis, we're going to need to construct a t-statistic. And the t-statistic is just equal to the estimated beta 1 hat minus the expected value of beta 1 hat conditional on the null hypothesis being true, divided through by the estimated standard error of beta 1 hat. Now, whenever you're presented with a regression result, you'll almost always be also presented with estimated standard errors. They're shown here in parentheses. So our beta 1 hat is just 1.359. The expected value of beta 1 hat, if the null hypothesis is true, well, if OLS is unbiased, then the expected value of beta 1 hat is just equal to beta 1. And if the null hypothesis is true, beta 1 would be equal to 0. So we'd substitute in 0 here. And the estimated standard error of beta 1 hat is given in parentheses here. The estimated standard error is just equal to 0.293. So we can substitute those numbers into our t-statistic formula, giving us that the, uh, the, the t-statistic related to beta 1 hat is equal to 4.64. Now, we need to compare this with the critical value from the t-tables. Now, how many degrees of freedom we, do we have here? Well, we've got 350 observations, and we've estimated two coefficients. We've estimated a beta naught, we've estimated a beta 1. We've got a beta naught hat as an estimate of beta naught, we've got a beta 1 hat as an estimate of beta 1. But by estimating those two coefficients, we're losing two degrees of freedom. So the number of degrees of freedom is going to be 350, the number of observations, minus the number of coefficients that we estimate, or 348. So our critical value in the t distribution with 348 degrees of freedom is going to be approximately 1.96. Our test statistic of 4.64 is larger in magnitude than 1.96. Therefore, we reject that null hypothesis. Now, the third step is, as I said earlier, the bit that people often forget about, but is probably the most important part of interpreting regression results. And what we're effectively asking is two questions. Firstly, what do the estimated coefficients actually mean? What is the marginal effect of a change in our explanatory variable on the dependent variable? And also, are the estimated coefficients large? So let's start with trying to interpret this 1.359. What does this actually mean? Well, what we could do is we could think of this as being a marginal effect. The marginal effect of increasing our explanatory variable by one is estimated to increase gross weekly wage by 1.359. So because employment in, uh, continuous employment in months is measured in months, this would be telling us that one extra month in continuous employment is equivalent to increasing gross weekly wages by £1.35.9 pence. Now, we could think about this a little bit more mathematically by thinking about what we would get if we differentiated this expression with relation to months continuously employed. So if we differentiated this expression with relation to months continuously employed, we just get 1.359. This intercept is just a constant. We differentiate 1.359 times by months continuous employed, and we just get 1.359. Now, this is giving us our marginal effect. And the derivative is defined as being the slope at the point where the 
change in months employed tends towards zero. But sometimes we might want to know the impact of more than one month increase in constant employment. So we can think of the change in the gross weekly wage as being approximately equal to 1.359 multiplied by the change in the months continuously employed. We've effectively moved away from the limit looking at the change in the gross weekly wage divided by the change in the months continuously employed and we've rewritten this as being equal to the change in the um, gross weekly wage is approximately equal to 1.359 times by the change in the months continuously employed. In, thi in this case, we might also think about increasing the months continuously employed by two. And in order to estimate the impact of two months extra continuously employed, we just multiply this 1.359 by two, giving us a change in the gross weekly wage being estimated as 2 times by 1.359 or 2.718. But we're not really fully interpreting the regression results yet. We're not really fully interpreting what this coefficient means because we haven't really thought about whether or not a one month or a two month increase in months um, continuously employed is actually a reasonable change. So whenever you're looking at regression results, it's important to think about what is a reasonable change in our explanatory variable. So far, we've looked at one or two months, but is that a, is that a substantial change? Well, in order to try and think about this, we might want to think about the summary statistics of the explanatory variable. So, Whenever we're measuring the size of an effect, we need to think about what is a reasonable change in our explanatory variable. And often we'll define a reasonable change as being one standard deviation. We'll think about a one standard deviation increase in our explanatory variable as being a reasonable change in that explanatory variable. So, what we define as a reasonable change will vary depending on the variable that we're using. If you're looking at data based on age, well, one standard deviation might not make any sense, particularly if you're looking at a subsample of a population. But in this case, we've got a, ra a set of random observations of individuals based on their months continuously employed. So we might be interested in a one standard deviation increase in months continuously employed. And based on the data that we've observed, the summary statistics give us that a one standard deviation increase in months continuously employed is 64.91 months. So a one month change is actually really small. It's, it's 1 65th of a standard deviation. So in reality, we might actually want to think, well, what's the impact of a larger change? What's the impact of a one standard deviation increase in months continuously employed? So in order to analyze that, let's consider a one standard deviation increase in months continuously employed. So what would be the impact of increasing our explanatory variable months continuously employed by 64.91 months, or in other words, one standard deviation of our explanatory variable. Well, in order to do this, what we would need to do is we need to take our estimated coefficient, 1.359, multiply it by that one standard deviation, which is multiplied by 64.91. And what we would get is that the estimated impact is to increase gross weekly wage by 1.359 times by that one standard deviation, times by 64.91 in this case, which would give us a change in the gross weekly wage of 88 pounds and 21 pence. So our estimated impact here is to increase gross weekly wage by 88 pounds, 21 pence.
But even now, we've not quite got to the answer about whether or not this is a big effect, because we don't know whether £88.21 is a big increase in gross weekly wage or not. So what we can do is we can compare this estimated impact with the standard deviation of gross weekly wages. We can ask how many standard deviations has gross weekly wages increased due to a one standard deviation increase in our months continuously employed. So how would we do this? Well, we just divide our estimated impact, this £88.21, by the standard deviation of gross weekly wage, or 88.21 divided by 365.08, which is, gives us a value of 0.242, which is telling us that a one standard deviation increase in our explanatory variable is associated with a 0.242 standard deviation increase in gross weekly wages. Now, the final step would be then to compare this effect with other estimated impacts. So, Blundell et al.'s 2004 paper estimates the impact of attending university is to increase um, lifetime earnings by about 0.628 standard deviations. So our estimated effect here of a one standard deviation increase in months continuously employed is less than that, but it's of the same sort of magnitude. So it's looking like a relatively large effect.